I think when it comes to someone that, that develops an influential status, there's a yin and a yang. You know, as powerful and as positive as your message is reaching the people who you believe are your audience, there's also that same amount of negativity and, 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 and hatred and dislike on the downside of people that don't like the message. Okay, so, so we've got that in society currently, mm. right? I mean, I just keep to myself a lot and try to always learn. And mm. you know, My sphere is very small, mm. I guess. And post selfless, right? uh, shirtless selfies. <laughs> 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 if my daughter wants to become a florist and open a shop and sell flowers and that makes her happy, that's all I care about. Do it. Yeah. I will not push her to become, she's very smart mm. and she's perfectly uh, capable of possibly following what she thinks she's going to do now, which is become a surgeon. Mm. I mean, she's 11 years old. What does she know? <laughs> what? Okay. She knows a lot. She hon- <laughs> no, man, she, she honestly. <laughs> <was the> <laughs> Okay, let me. <laughs> okay, guys, we actually did to like at least 15 minutes of a chat before this, uh, but we forgot to push record on the sound. So, uh, quick little recap. Um, <laughs> welcome back to The Modern Man. First time shooting again in like four months with an actual team. It's Nabil's first time as a co host. This literally feels like deja vu. Uh, <laughs> we have a very cool guest today, Andrew Carruthers here from The Relentless Man. He is a motivational speaker. Uh, mindset coach, all around cool motherfucker, and fucked his beard up, unfortunately, but he's on his way back to growing it. So uh, <laughs> I'm quite jealous looking at yours, actually, because, <laughs> because mine used to be longer than that, but now I've got to grow it again. So I think this is probably one of the longest I've grown mine, like lengthwise, yeah, in a while. It used to like annoy me completely, but now that I go once a week, it kind of it's easier to keep control of. Because even this shave head thing, like yours, how often do you have to shave your head? I I shave it with a blade probably once every two weeks. Other than that, I just use a okay, at least just use a, a clipper. Blade, yeah, it's not too bad. See, like mine, I got to fade the side, so I got to go once a week. Otherwise, I look like a tennis ball. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we just spoke about you coming here. You were yeah, seven years old. That when you moved to the side, um, you used to be a magazine publisher. Yeah, did seventeen years in ma- in uh, magazine publishing for fitness, fit, fitness, yeah, bodybuilding and fitness, man. Okay, so that's how you got into the whole. Like actual being fit because you're a fucking strong looking guy, bro. <laughs> like you look like hey, you can do some damage, bro. I've been training since I was 17 years old, so I mean I'm 47 now. Oh wow! So I've been doing yeah, I've done a good 30 years of time. I did two competitions in uh, 2005, and uh, yeah, I've always been a part of the bodybuilding and fitness um, sport. Talking about that quickly, because obviously you you're a big fitness freak now as well. How important is fitness to you? as like everything from your mental health to your the way you move the way you do life look i mean from a from a um from a health perspective obviously it's important to me uh when you've been training for as long as i have you know the the uh, the feeling of physical strength is something that you never stop seeking Mm. and i've always enjoyed training i've always been passionate about training and i really do enjoy it and um but uh, competing wasn't for me i mean i did i did two shows within two weeks of each other in 2005 and at the time um publishing was no joke i mean the the amount of work the amount of sales i had to do and uh what what dieting and and going through a pre-contest prep did to me and and how it affected my workload Mm. at the time i decided listen i'm doing these two shows and then i'm calling it because it was heavy on the body i mean the last two weeks before a show you literally lie on a couch you train you eat and you lie on a couch because you're just basically brain dead you know it's hectic but then is it worth it like i I know a lot of people have said that they tried it once and it just completely like their like mental ability even like because gabby said that in the one podcast she said that she did it and she said she'll never go back to doing that again like ever taking it to such an extreme i was hosting the uh wbff show that gabby competed in when she got her pro card oh for the vegas thing when when she got invited uh, to vegas first in south africa yes yeah where, first, where yeah. she got her pro card and yeah. then and then she went to vegas so i know she looked phenomenal she looked really good but that like if you look at that photo she posted she, she actually posted that photo the other day look at her then compared to now mm. it's it doesn't look you could probably walk past it's not the same person you've got to be you've got to be um very you've got to be very passionate about competing uh it it really has a huge impact on your your family life yeah your social life um not that that's important but 
you've got to really be into it. I mean, the amount of dedication that it takes to eat all those meals every day, to train that hard, mm -hmm. and obviously to get your body fat levels down as low minimal. as you do, you know, to minimal. And it puts a lot of stress on the body. Yeah. You know, and, and to try and sit in a chair and do eight, nine hours work a day as well at the same time, it's very difficult. See, very I don't taxing. think that's, a, that's, that's viable if you have to have a full-time job and then still try to go compete on the side. That's the thing. A lot, a, of people, a lot of people have to balance career yeah. versus sport, you yeah. know, and it's very hard to take both with you. One will always suffer. For sure, for sure. I mean, like uh, when I sat with uh, Sibyl Ciso, he, uh, that's his full-time life, is training, yeah. competing, you know, so... Every week he's going to the chiropractor to this, to that, to make sure that his body's in complete physical, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what optimum levels. But, but if you're working eight, nine hours, you're not getting the time to do that, to eat right, to train properly, mm -hmm. to go to the uh, stuff like that. So it must take a toll on your mental. The thing about Cebu is he is so genetically gifted. I mean, I take nothing away from his work ethic. But when you, when you know that you are that genetically gifted and you have the opportunity and, and the, the capability of making it to the really big stage, like yeah. the Olympia, yeah, yeah, yeah. then, I mean, by all means, go for yeah, it. Oh, for sure. But then, Otherwise, I mean, you're wasting the talent, yeah. in a sense. But there are a lot of guys that will are not genetically gifted. They have to train harder than the guys that are genetically gifted, mm -hmm. and they end up obviously overdoing certain things and maybe hurting themselves and, and uh, damaging their health. And that's where you really got to weigh up, you know, is this something that I want to take forward? Mm. Um, one of the hardest things I think in, in the bodybuilding game is to come to terms with the fact whether or not you are genetically prone to being a bodybuilder or being a fitness athlete or whatever it is. Because a lot of guys are not, but they'll do all the work and they'll take all the drugs and they'll do everything that it takes to get there. And then when they get there, and their health starts failing them, I mean, what do you have left after that? Then you've got to start looking for a job or you've got to start working on your career again. And I mean, and you've got to fix is your it yeah, is it really worthwhile? I have a question, Andrew. Is, it, is there a healthy way to do it? Yes, there is a healthy way to do it. But does that come at a cost of possibly winning? I think, look, I mean... That's if a good do, question because a lot of things, sometimes to be number one, you do something that's not healthy for you. You get, take it to a level. you get steroid use and you get steroid abuse. And I think a lot of guys abuse it. And, you know, um, a lot of people also, the smart ones, will go through the procedures of getting their blood work done on a regular basis to make sure, you know, the liver's not toxic or uh, the kidneys are not having a hard time with the gear, etc. So, yeah, there are smart ways of doing it. But, I mean, PEDs are PEDs at the end of the day. Uh, steroid use is steroid use and how it affects people differently or genetically. Some people might be genetically prone to weak kidneys or kidney problems, kidney failure. I mean, we've had so much of that in the sport over the years mm -hmm. with people taking excessive amounts of uh, PEDs and other things which we won't get into. But um, yes, there is a smart way of going mm -hmm. about it. And throughout my publishing career, I mean, I got to interview some of the top, top athletes in, mm -hmm. in the world. And when I would put out, name drop there for us. Yeah, Lee Priest, uh, yeah. Ronnie Coleman, I toured Ronnie Col with Whoa. Ronnie Coleman around South Africa. <laughs> Lightweight, baby. <laughs> for a week. Um, How big is that man? Sorry. No, massive. Absolutely like, massive. Like, uh, height size, like, because he, he just looks like an absolute brick shit house. He, he is massive. It was 2005 when I competed and we did a, uh, we did a nationwide uh, tour. And I remember the one morning he would he would give us these um, grits. He calls them grits, which is like oats in the U.S. He would give us a tin and he would ask the hotel to please prepare them for him when he came down in the morning. And I just remember the one morning he came down to breakfast and he sat down next to me. He had yellow tights, uh, gym tights on. And literally from his groin down to his knee, it just looked like one massive lightning strike all the way down to his leg. And when he sits on a table like this, I mean, he puts his elbows on the table and he uses a spoon to eat his porridge with, his bicep was sitting on the table. <laughs> that was mad. I've That's never, like a freak of nature, bro. I've never Using ever the word freak seen lightly. such a massive man in my life. And you can imagine what it was like just simply walking around the city or walking around the waterfront with someone like that. I mean, everybody's heads were turning. Just, you know. I told you. Uh, he's a little bit taller than me, so I'm I'm one seven eight. So he's he's all, I think he's about six foot. Hmm. Okay, that to be that big at six foot, like yeah. only, that, he is tall. 
I mean, Ronnie Coleman is. He's the epitome of. He's, he's incredibly, he's a goat, mm. right? Yeah, he's a goat. And mm. you're saying genetically gifted. I think he was, he was literally born to do all of this. Mm. He's, he's amazing. It's unbelievable, bro. Yeah. Except that voice. So, ru- <laughs> ru- rumor has it. Yeah. Right. Rumor, because it was never published. But some of the guys told us, some of the other pros that I'd um, toured with said that one of the Mr. Olympias back in the day, there was a scientist or some team that came through and they did myostatin tests on all the athletes where they draw a bit of blood. And then what they do is they, they calculate the amount of myostatin in one's blood. Now, myostatin, as you may know, is... I don't know. Please. <laughs> w- what it does is um, it, it doesn't allow the body to grow overly excessive. So in other words, if you, were to, if you had no myostatin in your, in your blood and you went and trained, there would be no limit to how big you could get. Okay. So that's why we're essentially sort of limited mm. uh, to a certain extent on certain size. size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ronnie and Flex Wheeler at the time showed the least amount of myostatin in their blood. That makes sense. Flex Wheeler was also a tank. Wow. So they could just grow and grow and grow. Because if you look at just photos of those oaks, it, it mm. doesn't look... You think to yourself, how do they naturally get, not naturally, but like physical human form? How mm. does it grow to that? So that oak must have at least walked like at this at this level, bro. But like I say, you can take all the anabolic steroids you want. If you're not genetically gifted to grow muscle, you, will, you won't grow muscle. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah, it's actually a <laughs> shame. Mm. <laughs> Nabs, would you ever compete, bro? I've been asked that question, mm. but I don't know. Uh, I would compete if I get a feeling that I want to compete. Mm. I haven't had that feeling yet. And you see, I've been an athlete all my life, so yeah. I've competed, but performance, right? Yeah, but not on Getting stage. Getting on stage, kind of I don't know. I don't know if, like... I, I, I have thought about it, but mm. I haven't come with an answer yet. How old are you now? 34 this month. Okay, still got yeah. time. Still got time. Hmm. You've maybe tried once. Yeah, and I mean, at the same time, you know, I was watching a video yesterday, um, Athlean X, right? And he was giving his opinion on uh, what happened with Joe Linda. Mm. Right, and uh, oh, I mean he Joe wasn't. Aesthetics. Yeah, Joe yeah, Stetics, yeah. right? Yeah. He he passed away apparently from a blood clot, and and apparently old, those right? things are not avoidable. So it's not linked to PED or steroid use. Mm. At least that's the messaging in the community. But it was an eighteen-minute video, and what he ended up talking about was PEDs, um, and the abuse thereof, and to what end, and how do you look and value life? Mm. But one thing that I'm remembering is if you put something in something else goes, and it's like levers. So unless you're working those levers ideally, you're comparing a perfectly working, healthy body, and this is my limited understanding, mm. or personally why I haven't Tried taken anything. anything. Yeah. But there's a lot of information these days, and I have considered uh, that I have kind of, I'm not close to it, but I imagine at around 40 plus, or at when, if the time arises, I wouldn't mind doing TRT or something that's safe and then yeah. keep your performance high or keep keep your body functioning more efficiently. I don't know, but we'll see. 40 is a good age to start TRT, obviously, depending on what your blood tests come back. Yeah, at. fair enough. Because so a lot of... To answer the question, TRT's I don't know. TRT testosterone, correct? TRT like testosterone, testosterone, correct. So yeah. I know a lot of guys that started that way too young. Yeah. Like, you know, when we left school. Because they wanted, you know, they mm. wanted to be the mana, the, the first boy kids. Yeah. They all hit like close to late 20s, early 30s. Couldn't get it up. Had, you know, no natural testosterone. Because my understanding of the body is when you put something in there artificially, the body stops producing it naturally because it's getting from a different source. Well, also, when you're doing it at a young age, when you have so much testosterone already, you don't need to take more, then it kind of stops that completely. And then by the time you hit like 30 something, there are are protocols involved to restart the natural system. Mm. And it's obviously something that uh, guys should be doing every couple of months just to clean out their system. Okay, like what? Um, you get you get um, anti-estrogens and um, you get um, human gonadotropin, and uh, you also get female female uh, drugs called Clomid, mm. which basically what they do is they bomb your body with a lot of female hormones, and then your body has no. Um, no alternative but to start regenerating the lady lady cells in the uh, in the testicles and start reproducing natural testosterone. Oh, so you kind of force it into like yeah, yeah. Because there's but a lot. Think of about how complex that is, right? See, but that and that's besides, life now. Or to, uh, coach once told me, 
uh, on this topic of would you compete that I'm actually, um, I would be competing against guys that are big. I'm small to start competing. Mm. So that... How much you weigh now, bro? 74. That's not too bad. Uh, I mean, relative to what, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I'm at the heaviest I've ever weighed. I'm at 97, bro. But that's all the beer for me. <laughs> I have a question, Andrew. Yes. Relentless man. Yes. What would you say is a relentless man? A relentless man is someone who, first of all, has their shit together, which is uh, quite a broad statement. But I was about to say, does anyone ever have all this shit together? No. I think we're living in really strange times, and there's a lot of external influence coming in. Um, one of the things we push on the group is uh, stoicism. I'm a big fan of stoicism. Mm -hmm. And obviously the key principles behind stoicism is that you need to control what is within and do not try and control what is without, external factors, yes. things like that. So I think a relentless man is someone that is that is conscious of their mindset, their behavior, um, how they treat other people, uh, their discipline, their purpose, and what drives them in life. Mm. And focusing on those or being conscious of those is, is something that I teach within my mindset coaching practice. And... Um, Basically, I think everything comes from within at mm. the end of the day. Instead of being bombarded by, you know, e external influences, um, societal abnormalities, you know, things coming up like gender and things like that that are really sort of push pushing masculinity down. Mm. And, you know, being a relentless man is basically just, just being an, in the true essence of the male form from a masculine point of view. And you created a group, right? And yes. you mentioned this uh, a bit earlier before we cut off and started again. <laughs> but there's a, <laughs> there's a group that you created <laughs> six months ago, right? Mm. And, and there was an overwhelming influx of, uh, of support, participation. What are we seeing today? And like, so let's start. I'm interested to know why did you start it? Okay. And what are you seeing from it? Get us up to speed. Well, just to go back to before I, I started mindset coaching, um, throughout... COVID, I knew of about eight people that committed suicide. And it was completely something that I wasn't um, even even focused on. It's something that I, I really took to heart because I'm quite an empathetic individual. And I decided that, you know, if I could have actually maybe gotten in front of those, those people who I knew really well and just maybe had a talk to them, I had a chat to them, I would have maybe been able to steer them away from the idea of suicide and so when i came up with the concept of creating the relentless man i wasn't even sure if it was going to work and i thought to myself here we go now i need to be the admin of a group on facebook and there's going to be infighting and i'm going to be just be spending all my time on this group and but i went for it anyway and i decided that look i set up a whole lot of rules before i created the group saying yeah there was quite a there will be no infighting There'll be no, um, you know, no one putting anyone down. There'll be no, um, no controversial topics, et cetera, et cetera. Please stick to the topics that we obviously put up. And funny enough, it, it literally took off. And guys were really craving a place where they could come and just open up about certain aspects of their lives that they weren't quite sure how to navigate. And what, what blew my mind even more was not so much the guys were opening up, but it was the fact that the members were coming back and saying, hey, brother, you know, I went through something similar. This is how I dealt with it. And here's my advice to you. And we've got some really good threads going on yeah. there where the guys are giving rock-solid advice because, A, they've been in the same boat or they've experienced something similar. And it's created this really good community where guys know that if they put something up that might be slightly embarrassing or slightly personal – um, no one comes at them and says, oh, you know, brother, you need yeah. to man up or you need to uh, you need to stop talking like it or don't be a pussy or yeah, whatever don't, it is. I said, don't be a pussy. No one so, says that. So I'm really proud of the guys that I've got in there. And we've got people from all walks of life. I mean, there's mercenaries. We have people that have been to war, mm -hmm. seen horrific things. Um, we've got we've got doctors. We've got lawyers. We've got we, – we even had people coming across saying, listen, guys, it seems to be a common trend that – uh, divorce and um, what's happening with the kids is a big topic in the group. Phone me for free advice. Here's my number. 
you know? support, right? Yeah, it's fantastic. It's, it's fantastic a complete support. support system. And it's honestly, it's so beautiful to see. Um, as I was saying, my dad was the one that invited me to the group. And as as you said, you before you started it, you thought, fuck, it's going to be one of those groups where, you know, I've, be, I've been on men mm. groups before. And as you say, it's normally there's in-house fighting. Um, they're talking about topics that are so irrelevant, you know, it's ego, you know, as you said, the ego, this mm. and that. But this group, when I was reading the post and you just, you see someone be so honest, so brutally honest and vulnerable in it. Mm. And then you see the people supporting them underneath. Like the nice thing is with the, the guys that are supporting them, they're not beating around the bush, no. which is nice. They're getting straight to the point saying, yes, I did this. This is why this is happening. Figure out why the problem is happening. And then they gave their solutions. And then everybody would have a good discussion. I don't think I've seen one argument on that thing. No. No, we've had and a for little, six months, it's it's actually it's it's incredible. We've had a little bit of bickering and and, and a couple of guys, you know, a few go, a few of the guys, including myself, are big Andrew Tate fans. We put up a couple of videos, and then you've got the guys that are very misinformed coming across. But oh, this guy's this, and this guy's that, and then there's infighting, and then they so generally, you know, they generally tend to leave the group on their own. You don't even have to kick them off. And they'll post that they're leaving the group. <laughs> it is even no. the worst part about no. it. I'm leaving the group. Leaves the group. Stupid. So you say you're an Andrew Tate fan, eh? I am an Andrew Tate fan, yeah. Yeah. See, now this is going to get, oh, I'm going to cut this so nicely because people love to cut the little pieces, especially about this Andrew Tate subject and the misinformation going around, especially from the female point of side saying it's so misogynistic mm. and all of those points. Don't get me wrong, there were some things that he said back 100%. then that was a bit really fucked up. But uh, they were, I don't agree with. But they were also very easy for them just to take little snippets That's of those saying, speeches ten seconds out of and context. make him look like the bad guy. For sure. And you go listen to Andrew Tate now. I think he's probably one of the best people that men mm. and boys growing up should be listening to. Mm. He actually said in one of his recent uh, interviews, I think it was with uh, DBP, he said... Oh, Patrick um, Bet david Yeah, yeah. He, he said that um he's he really has to concentrate and focus on how he puts his words together now he said whereas in the past he'd be on a he'd be on a podcast with like two guys and five chicks or whatever and he'd just say whatever came to his mind exactly so he says he's had to stop doing that to 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 really dial into making his point clear so that if anyone edits it and cuts it up and tries to make him look like the bad guy they can't anymore they can't it's actually it's wild because he's uh, he's very controversial and the reason why is because in my opinion, the society that we're in at the moment is so so soft and everybody, it's a cancel culture, you know. It's, it's If you hurt my feelings, you are wrong. Instead of back in the day when if you hurt someone's feelings, okay, you had a, dif a difference of opinions, which is, in my point, a lot healthier than the shit that we're going through right now. Mm. Like if I say something, yeah, and somebody disagrees with it, they have now completely told me that I am a bad person. You, for, you don't know me. <laughs> You know what I mean? And then mm. they, they're judging you just on that specific little thing that you said mm. and basing your whole character around that instead of actually finding out more with the information that they don't have. So People are quick to take things at face value and not really sort of digest the information mm. that's being given and then sort of make a, a relatively intelligent decision about said person, you know? It's actually ridiculous. It's so <laughs> people suck these days. Like you can't you can't say anything without somebody. And you know the point is the for me the point is you shouldn't say something and then expect no one to have a problem with it. I think there's a lot of people that also try to say some shit and then they get upset when somebody gets upset with them. You know, then it's a fight of who's wrong and this and that. You know, everybody, as I say, is entitled to their opinions, but you also shouldn't hold back on certain things again certain things mm. um or be scared to say certain things you know stand up for yourself you know if you believe your point is right make your case mm. don't tell them they're wrong because you don't know if they're wrong everybody could be right everybody could be wrong but people are just so soft and i think that's also the problem with a lot of men these days it's so easy to be one of the better men if I can put it in that sense, uh, uh, how do I say, higher class, what do they call it, high value men these days? Because it's not that difficult compared to the amount of guys around us at the moment. Mm. They're I, so soft. I think when it comes to someone that, that develops an influential status, there's a yin and a yang. You know, As powerful and as positive as your message is reaching the people who you believe are your audience, there's also that same amount of negativity and, 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 and hatred and dislike on the downside of people that don't like the message. Mm. So you've got to you've got to take the good with the bad. And 
as long as you know that at least half of what you're doing is is really pushing and motivating other people and uh, to live 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 their best life or become a better man or become a better person, then I think the uh, the negative side of things wouldn't bother me at all because as as long as the positive side was growing, the negative wouldn't really bother me. Because there's always people that are going to have something to say, and you know. You put 50 people in a room and you say one sentence, 50 people are going to interpret it differently. Oh, for sure. So so most of it is misinterpretation. Mm. So it's not, I always say it's not the communication that matters, it's the understanding Correct. of it. I mean, uh, I suppose it's also the real world versus online, right? Because we right. live in two worlds if you think about Definitely. it. That's very and personally, true. I'm sitting here listening. Uh, I can't wait to spend some time reading comments on a group I haven't yet. And listening to this, I'm partnered with me not seeing the group. I'm generally that type of person that I don't spend too much time online. I post online. Mm. But you don't but scroll. I spend a lot of time here with myself, real world training. And I try to mm. not go down too many rabbit holes, if any. So Facebook groups for me or groups in general online, I don't, I don't, I haven't in the past. It's not what I tend to go to. But I'm very intrigued listening to what you've mm -hmm. created mm -hmm. and what that space is like. And, but what I can uh, comment on is the, the term keyboard warrior, <sighs> right? I mean, I've been recently having a few posts go viral and it's cool and all of that. But you'll see somebody commenting like silly stuff, man. Mm. Why are you sumo scotting? That doesn't count. <laughs> and in my head, I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> but I also know, I don't know this person. And like you say, yin and yang, I actually don't. And you go look at that person's but, profile. They've got 12 man. followers. They've got no profile picture. It's just. But isn't this the point, right? Yeah. Like, does it actually matter? But do you get people talking shit about your podcast? All the time, bro. Yeah. Not as much as, honestly, when I started this podcast, because, oh, okay, myself as a person, I'm very... Andrew Tate, before he started thinking about what he says, you know, like I also say some <laughs> shit that just pops into my head and I yeah. realize a little bit later that it's a bit uh, stupid. But I kind of understand that that's kind of the point of this is to also like watch myself develop as a person over the time. I mean, now tomorrow is exactly nine months since we released our first episode. So to be nearly a year in doing this, I'm very proud of it because, you know, a lot of people start a project and then mm. just stop it. But um, a lot of people with this podcast, it depends on the person that we're speaking with, they we get a lot of hate publicly. Not a lot. I won't say it's as much as I thought it would have been. But the haters will comment publicly, tell you that it's this, it's that, or whatever. The people that agree with it is private. Mm. I have, I mean, I've said some things of my opinion about the way women should be in a certain way, you know. And um, the women that agree with me completely, they'll message me and say this is... You know, it's a harsh truth. You sound like an asshole, but you're an honest <laughs> asshole, which is what I, I'm trying to, you know, that, that, that's the thing that I want to go for. I'm an, I'm an asshole. I'm not, I'm not the, I'm a good person, but I'm an asshole. I'm you're honest trying. about it. You know, I try, you know, I make a conscious effort in trying. No, you're making the jokes here, Maddie. When you know, I did the, when yeah. you introduced me to the podcast as a host, yeah. I got a few DMs saying, uh, how are you spending time with Manny? And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> and I got what you're saying. This yeah. is interesting that you're aware of this, right? And I yeah. was like, well, to be honest, from what I know of Manny, he's a nice guy. Mm. And the truth is, how well do you know him? How well do you know anyone? See, exactly. And this is mm. the whole, uh, one of the points, I guess, is you can't judge anyone. Like, And, and even, can you judge someone today uh, that may be classified as a bad person and completely disregard the fact that one moment can change their perspective and they can do so much good that's which true. is i say coming back to which intrigues me mm. is because when when we come and not just men i suppose everybody needs support um when people mm. can come to this point and you said it earlier possibly before we cut off so i'll repeat it again mm. where you created a space for people to open be open and share uh, i think all we can do is listen partner of stoicism all we can do is control what we are in control of self-awareness and if everybody shows up that way mm. with the intention to do somebody good or help somebody out we mm. create a better space irrespective of what the format is do you agree andrew 100 percent. my my um when i began my mindset coaching through the different courses that i did the first one of the first things that that became apparent to me was i started to understand 
why some people are the way they are. Because mm. like I said to you earlier now, some people have a certain way of understanding things and other people have a certain way of understanding things. And when you learn that everyone's different, mm. it, it makes you a lot more um, less likely to judge people. Oh, for sure. So when I'm I sitting in a room and I see a weirdo in the corner, which everyone would consider a weirdo. <laughs> you also think what makes he, him he a weirdo? He intrigues yeah. the hell out of me and I yeah. want to know, why? that guy's not a weirdo. To, to me, he's unique. Yeah. Mm. You know, weird and unique, and everyone's got yeah. everyone's got unique uh, behavioral um, things about them. And when you when you learn to understand that, you know, learn to see the world in two things: good and evil. And if someone's weird, but they're not doing anything bad, then maybe they're just different. You know, like respect different, mm. respect the fact that people have opinions, respect that I appreciate people more, don't yeah. always understand things from your level of understanding and when you come to terms with that you it makes your life a lot easier because you don't judge anyone you don't box label people mm. you you leave them be mm. and then you give them time to sort of show you who they are yeah and in doing so you get to appreciate why he might be the way he is you but a lot of people you, you are quick just to story, slap yeah. a white label on and say weirdo yeah, yeah. You know, yeah idiot or whatever yeah. which and is actually very... quite sad because the people that do that give up so much like there's so much left on the table yeah because they pick it, it up at human face beings are special say, yeah. right and you never know you i think. mean that was a cool story uh my brother went to a conference in another country and it just so happened um that as he went there with samples and stock etc uh the Immigration control confiscated all of it. So now he's in a different country with no samples to give in a new market. And what do you do? Five, six days at a, at a conference showing up and telling people that you've got a great product, but you can't show it to them. <laughs> and you kind of have nobody in a, And he's a big, big fish in, yeah, yeah. in, in this pond. But different country, you're starting fresh. Exactly. So it's very overwhelming for him. Mm. And weirdly enough, this is the short version of the story. He bumped into a random guy, kitted out, Louis Vuitton, etc., and uh, the guy was like, hey, Akil, what are you doing here? It turns out that at a couple of years ago at another conference, that guy was a small fish in the, in the pond. And no, my brother spent fish. time mm. just Challenge. helping him out, pointing him, guiding him, giving him advices, and spent a lot of time just... And, mm. and that's who my brother is, like if you ever get to meet him. And we'll have him on the podcast as well. Isn't he your twin brother? Guy, triplet brother, yeah. Triplet brother. Um, <laughs> he gives time. There's three he just, of these. Wherever you can support, he will. It turns out that guy actually organized the whole local event. So he's the wow. main shot of the event, wow. and it changed the entire experience. Now, you never know who... Or, who? Uh, yeah, who can... Well, not necessarily just or in business, but be. who can save your life, who will help you change your tire, who can avoid a situation, who can bring value or be a mm. blessing in your life. Mm. And by discounting people or putting labels and judging them, mm. I mean, what are you leaving out there for humanity to show itself? But, Never underestimate anyone. No, never. You walk into a room of 10 guys, okay, and there's a lot of ego in this corner and there's the sort of a quiet corner over there. You know, um, confidence and success is always quiet. Mm. Weakness and, and insecurity is always loud. Mm. So, I mean, if, you're, if you feel like you want to join the ego side and you want to have a bit of a cocksword contest about who's got the bigger project going on or who drives the faster car or whatever, which is stuff I completely despise, you're looking in the wrong corner of the room. I mean, the guy who's sitting there quietly eating his meal might be th the most incredible guy to network with. Mm. He might have the most valuable advice for you and he might even be in a position to push you in a direction that will show you major success, you know, so never underestimate anybody. Yeah. How important do you think networking is? I've been, I've, I've, I've spoken this a, a couple of times. How important do you think networking is in your life? I think it depends on the concentration of the quality of the individuals that you're networking with. Mm. Because a lot of people see networking as just going out, socializing, talking to anyone. Drinking. And then by the end of the night, it's almost like, Okay, well, nothing came about any of those sort of business conversations that I had with anyone. Mm. Um, the one thing I do believe in is is, is uh, creating firm relationships with people and getting out into a social space is very important. You know, mm. people are a lot more likely to uh, remember you for your sort of charismatic side. 
you know, around maybe some social drinking or whatever. Um, I think it's really important, mm. you know. I always say, like, um, back in the day when I was s selling advertising, you know, my clients and I had a great friendship slash relationship and, mm. and I was always prepared to listen to what they required as a client and sort of try and implement it into the magazines and they appreciated that and I think that it's important to uh, have the best people not necessarily the best price and what I mean by that is let's say I'm in competition um, with you you're selling the same thing I'm selling mm. but I have a more charismatic friendly sort of outgoing way with the client that client might generally take me on instead of you because maybe you're maybe you're a little bit you know you don't like to talk too much and and he doesn't really sort of get on with you mm. I would much rather have a person's character For sure. in my space For sure. than sort of someone that just comes in and sells me a product every other month you know, I'd rather build up a rapport and build up some kind of relationship. Uh, relationship. Yeah, I yeah. would. A lot of, there's a lot of studies that have been done that actually say that the most influential factor of a sale or a service is person, not price, not mm. okay. Quality is second, actually, which, but person, person, the person, person that yeah. you're dealing with is probably the most likely thing to get somebody to buy into your product or your service. But you also have to deal with those people over and over and over again, and that's time. I mean, you don't want to be dealing with people that you don't have any kind of connection or relationship with. You know what I've been wrapping around my head lately is, as you say that at the time, um, is that this, I started reading a book, uh, The Way of the Superior Man from David Data. I don't know if you guys have read it. What a fucking book. Like truly like one of the best reads I've ever had in my entire life. And it was first of all speaking about the self awareness thing, the saying that a man's best quality, the most important trait is to know what's going on inside. If you know what's going on inside, the outside won't hurt you. But um it was saying that you shouldn't be in a rush for things. So obviously it was teaching some patience one. But saying you have an idea, you have an end goal kind of thing, you know, like we have an end goal for this, you know, we want to be one of the best podcasts, one of the best YouTube channels, stuff like that. That doesn't happen, like in a, in a certain way. Like there's no one day when, because when that one day when comes, you've forgotten about that one day when. Mm. So you get to that point, you're already thinking of one day when in the further future. So it's like a one day when I have all of this, I'm going to be happy, truly happy. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do whatever. But when you're in the system, in the, the process. That is the actual important part because that never, ever ends. Like that that process never ends because as soon as you say, you say, one day when I have, let me say, example, one day when I have a Lamborghini, I know I made it. But one day when I have a Lamborghini, then I'm going to look, fuck, I need to have a yacht, man. Then I made it. Then I have a yacht. Then I, have, I need a jet. Or then I need, just you know, just, this or that. You touched on about six different topics there. Yeah, I know. Sorry. But <laughs> <laughs> my point was, no, was with great. the time was, yeah. as you say, like with the business kind of thing, you need to be able to take the time to know that it's not going to happen now. You yeah. need to consistently work and work. And it's a never-ending work, a never-ending journey with that, mm. let's say, a client, a relationship, a business. So your end goal doesn't just smack mm. out right in front of you because you've done certain things. I think don't ever just measure yourself against more. And when I say more, I mean more like material things, bigger house, boat, car, yacht, whatever it is. You know, I think that that's a fundamental issue we have today is people are constantly measuring, especially men, when, especially where there's ego involved. They're constantly measuring themselves against the next car, the next bike, the next house, the next everything, you know. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. That's true, but is it not, how do I say, it's kind of been like that for however long because of the way, let me say the way society, in my opinion, the way society views a man. For a man to be valuable, he needs to provide. Provide, protect, serve, create, you know, in my opinion. But the way that society thinks, as you say, the the cars, the yachts, the you know, the materialistic things, that's seen as Well, think about what successful. you just said. You said a man, just repeat that for me, a man um, needs provides, to provide, creates, create. protects. So what, yeah. what you're describing there is a man's actually giving. Yeah, giving. Is there any giving in buying a car and comparing? No. no. This is the problem. I no. think fundamentally. But people uh, see that as that, that guy's a better man because he's got a. So just in that 
that perspective, Sistar has got a bad angle on what a good man is and what a bad man is. I got a question. You know to, I mean? to what purpose? Yeah, yeah right? this it, is it depends. Important. Also, yeah, it's all contextual. I get it. But yeah, because w- without purpose, all we have is to compare. Because then you're comparing to somebody else's purpose. Somebody wins a bodybuilding competition. I can only imagine the scenario. And you go, I look better than that guy. Well, then why aren't you up on stage? What is your purpose? There is no purpose. You're just looking and feeling the bad aspects of the yin-yang uh, balance, right? Mm. You're tapping into what human nature is. Mm. By nature, we're not perfect, in my opinion, right? It's, and, and it's that work that towards purpose and partner with all the cool things that you start finding out who you are, start giving more, and uh, you, you end up enjoying the journey or whatever comes from it from, from a beneficial perspective. Mm. And then there's this this aspect that I've been thinking about for the last couple of years actually is that we that I don't feel like we have, which is community. Mm. And then we come back to little spaces where yes, people right. can uh, share. No, there is no community. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I created the group on Facebook. Mm. Because, you know, we're, men men these days just, just really stick to themselves and they sort of just digest their own problems and their issues and there's a massive lack of community amongst men and that's why i created the group so that's that that would be the purpose so six months in andrew what do you what do you hope or where do you see it going yeah where would you like to see it go i'd obviously like to see a lot more men inside the group you know get a lot more members um maybe seeing it go a little bit more international as well because it's still very south african at the moment um at the end of the day it's not something i really intend on 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 turning into something that would be deemed as a business model or something i mean i obviously use it for uh marketing myself my motivational uh talking my own um my own mindset coaching Mm. classes etc but i think once we've grown to a substantial number i'd like to maybe set up maybe a conference or some kind of seminars and get I the guys. I think that would be cool, like seminars and conferences. Yeah, really do some I mean, good locations. Uh, creating a donation link. Because like any community, I mean, imagine we have a braai. Everyone brings <laughs> their dope and chop. Yeah, I mean, yeah, to make it happen. Contribute. Mm. A community mm. is some place that mm. actually you exist within. I think a very important part of that group would be to maybe um, find a venue that obviously has a decent seminar hall or some kind of a, you know, auditorium where we can do talks and and that but then at the same time have a social aspect to it afterwards where the guys can really come together and right off the bat everyone's under the same impression as to what to expect because they've been through the group they know how compassionate and empathetic the guys are so they're not walking into conversations going i wonder if this guy's going to think i'm an idiot because everyone's sort of out there to go hey brother how you doing Hmm. how you doing today you know how's your day how's your day going what's got you going and that's what it's about so I think having having the group to create that vibe first and then sort of bring it into the real world mm. is a really good way of going about it. I definitely, I think that would be amazing. It would be a great event, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, you can kind of sing there, bro. <laughs> like I'm the name that. How can I help? <laughs> <laughs> and you yourself, what do you, what do, you, what do you see yourself? You're 47 now. That's still young. You know, a lot of people won't think that as young. I like, like to think it's still young. <laughs> <laughs> or so I tell myself. <laughs> we just learned my dad's 57 and he tells himself that he's still young all the time. So um, wh- wh- where are you going from here? What is what is your next step in your journey? You're going to carry on with the mindset, coaching, the things, stuff like that? Yeah, look, um, I'll be honest with you. I'm, obviously, I've come off a very big career in publishing. Um, I'm still sort of tiptoeing my way around things at the moment. I mean, like doing mindset coaching and and holding seminars and doing you know corporate gigs and stuff has been uh it's it's obviously new to me i'm not new to public speaking but Mm. but i'm new to obviously stepping inside the corporate world and doing a doing a few um mindset seminars etc but for me i'd like to grow the relentless brand as much as i can and create you know um obviously that community we've just uh, discussed but at the same time also be able to um, go around the country and do motivational talks which are really geared towards helping helping men's mental health mm. and that is something i'm very passionate about uh 
I've always been a bit of a jack of all trades. I've always been an entrepreneur. I'm not scared to start things, end things, try new things. So I'm always looking for things to do. Love that. Yeah. But one of my one of my core purposes is definitely to uh, travel around a bit and and have have more of a positive impact on men's mental health. That's that's beautiful. I'd like you know, the, the world needs more men like you. Um, talking just sorry on that point. How difficult is it to put yourself in that limelight because? It's not a subject that gets spoken about often. I mean, now just last month was Men's Mental Health Month. And I think I saw maybe, uh, now my Instagram, I think I maybe saw like five pages actually post about it. Mm -hmm. But everywhere from the corporates and stuff and that, they all posting Pride Month. So in my like opinion, you're saying that Pride is a whole lot more important than men's mental health, the, the backbone of, any economy and country that do the building, mm. the, the everything like that, their mental health is. You're kind of saying it's mm. it's coming second mm. best to mm. something else. No matter what it is, it's, it's second second best. Look, these are the times we're living in. You know, and men um, positive masculinity in men is definitely being shunned. Yeah. And so, the question of you know how would I how would I take it from here? I mean, I'm not a one of my one of my um, one of my go-to quotes for Relentless as a brand is zero fucks given. I mean, I'm not an individual that cares about other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. As long as in my heart I know that I'm doing something that's yes, positive yes, yes. and and has an inspirational or an aspirational level to it and it's helping other people, that's all I really care about. I've never been one to really delve in the opinions of others and, and really worry about what society is doing. You know, because mm -hmm. if I see a need for something and I think there's a, serious need for for m motivating men you know to be masculine better again. better more masculine um have have better mental health and if i see a if i see gaps for that i, I mean i'm in i don't really care who's who's saying it's not a good thing yes I have a question <laughs> what? you can't what? go to the bathroom <laughs> what the <hell? laughs> what's positive masculinity see that's 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 also another question. Well, let's turn it around. What's toxic masculinity? Yeah, yes, what is this? I don't know. I don't so know. you see, for me now, this <laughs> is where the, the. I think that should also be taught not to like men have one. We need to support men in one way. Mm. I think we need to teach the rest of the world. What is actual positive masculinity? So if a guy is doing this, it's teach not in first, a bad Bob, way. What, <laughs> what, Andrew, what, I mean. what Andrew Tate's pushing is pure positive masculinity. It mm. is. Supporting your family, looking after your wife, um, creating a safe environment for your children, uh, creating hard. good, strong values for your children, a good upbringing, uh, working hard, having a purpose. Um, all the things that you know men used to be 10, 20 years ago. Right. Okay. And then toxic masculinity? Toxic masculinity is the guy who goes home and uh, treats his wife like shit, spends no time with his kids. Uh, sits and plays video games all day, Treats other men has like no that. purpose, doesn't work hard, doesn't push for financial security, all those things that sort of push life down as opposed to pick it up. No, no, what, what's, what's the <laughs> word? No, no benefit to any community or any Correct. society is, is, is so, toxic. So you get selfish people yeah. and you get how people should be, yeah. which is positive masculinity, mm. right? Okay, so, so we've got that in society currently, mm. right? I mean, I just keep to myself a lot and try to always learn. And mm. you know, My sphere is very small, I guess. And post selfies, right? uh, shirtless selfies. <laughs> <laughs> Does that add to positive masculinity? Or? No, it's positive because no, no, people want to look. That, that's a genuinely good thing because yeah, people can see it as egotistical, but they see no, because, look, so, you, you're so, in shape. So it, depends, shape. it depends if it's one selfie a day or 50. Sure. One, about one is positive. Reels a day. One post a day. <laughs> one, post, one post a day is about right. If you're posting 50, then we need to look at your ego a little bit. <laughs> okay. So, so where's it coming from is, as, as you guys were speaking, firstly, thanks for the answers because I never actually known. Mm. You know, I just don't pay attention to that. Um, but in, in accordance to what we speak here about, how may, maybe there are a lot of people out there that just don't know that there is that they need, that they may be suffering with mental health? Are there any like key signs yeah, that, telltale, uh, signs, that yeah. telltale signs that you may be suffering with some mental health issues that, that you could share? I think a lot of guys 
cover it up and they hold back and obviously they don't share. So I think off the bat, it's quite difficult to sort of immediately say, sit down at a table with five guys and, and sort of pick up mental health, mental health, mental health, you know, that kind of thing, unless people start sharing. I think it's very, um, it's tough to know what people are going through if they're not sharing. And that's half the problem because no one's really giving, um, giving people channels or the ability to share. Well, if for anyone listening, I hope this message hits you clearly. Mm. It's okay to share. But share with the right people. Uh, I think that, that's... Uh, let's not put any barriers in it. Just <laughs> yeah, share. No, no. I'm just going to say, for <laughs> me, that, that, that's, that's something that like stops me sometimes that I also go through. Like I, I personally, like one thing, I, I know I'm, I'm very self-aware of things. I know I, like, I have mental health problems at times. You know, I also like to keep things in, not share it. Some problems, you know, like there's certain... Would you like to share one with us? Right now. Let me well, see. If you don't want to. Hey? If you don't want to, no question. I'll think about it, but I'll, I'll let you. it out now. Yeah. But um, as I say, like, I think that's probably one of the things that stop men from sharing is mm. the, as you say, the judgment yeah. from other people. The But the, it's stereotypically the, deemed as weak. Uh, see, that's it. That's it. A so lot you're people, showing weakness by sharing, which, is, which couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. So in the same token, let's say I walk into a room and I am... I am I am kind and and sincere. Am I being a weak male? No. Why not? Why must because I be kind? Lot, That's weakness. Because it's harder to be kind than it is to correct. Be an a- like okay, not a, I, I'm an asshole, but <laughs> you know, like ugly yeah. to people, uh, maliciously mm. thing. It's easy to go up and tell someone, "Are oh, you shit?" Well, some of the um, some of the Afrikaans boys on the group, I mean, and they like proper Borussians that that come and talk about you know things that they want to talk about. They, they openly admit in their first few lines that I wasn't brought up to share things. I was brought up to um, just sort of deal with my issues and deal with my problems. And it's that upbringing from possibly that really strict father that never allowed his son to not necessarily moan or complain about things, but maybe just express himself a little bit more. True. You know, um, gee, I, have, I have a story, a good friend of mine, uh, Simon, he he recently did some work with a father and son. More work with the father than the son. And, and what it actually comes down to is throughout the child's entire life, his father had never told him once that he loved him. So Simon worked with him um, for, for a couple of months or a couple of weeks. I can't remember what it was. And the son, unbeknown to um, the father, the son was actually suicidal. And how Simon actually came around and, 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 and brought that unity between the father and son again was he basically drilled it into the father that he needs to tell his son that he loves him. And one day in the car, I believe he told him that um, he broke down and told his son that he loved him. And it, and it created a unity that they have not had throughout the son's entire life. So, I mean, you know, showing, showing compassion yeah. and showing empathy and showing love especially – but these are not these are not weak traits. These are these are very strong traits. Which it's hard to do. we're emotional beings. I mean, mm-hmm. why block emotion out and just expect someone to be a sort of hard ass or hard version of themselves? Mm. Because I think, also, but that's also from let's say father's past, from the father's past. They, that's always been the the mindset. But is it's our responsibility so, to break generational to break curses completely. I mean, um, yeah. As as you guys know, I was just on holiday with my father for. Two and a half weeks. And if, if you know the both of us, I, can, I can't believe that we didn't fight. I even said into the other one. But him and I shared so much. And we went kind of... A couple of years ago, he wasn't that open to understanding more. You know, his way was mm. the way. It's either that way or the highway. Set in his ways. You know what I mean? Set in his ways. Which is most... It's genuine. You know, like I can understand it because that's majority of how men at that age... They were brought up that way. So they don't know any different. Mm. Um. And we actually sat down at a stage and we drank a good cup of whiskeys, had some cigars and six hours, six, seven hours. We just two men chatted. We were Mm. crying, Mm. you know, like I told him our fault as Mm. a son, you know, like, cause now obviously I'm seeing a lot more of this because I understand a lot more because it's everywhere, you know, like the, how you should be fixing relationships and stuff like that. And then he also, you know, like shared it from his side. You know, this is what he thinks. This is how his brain works, stuff like that. And it was such a beautiful experience to understand mm. from his 
point of view, you know, he's seeing this obviously mm. like every other man, you make mistakes, but you don't want other people to make your mistakes. Mm. And, you know, obviously that's why he used to get upset or this or that. Um, but that's also why he was hard, you know, to push further, to push further for his kids. Mm. And also why he worked so hard. He was, you know, like hardly at home. He was always working long days, traveling overseas and stuff to provide, you know, that, that was his mindset. But, uh, yeah, then we we just kind of like had a full on heart to heart. We cried. It was the most beautiful thing. And I think that changed my relationship with my dad. And I, as you say, like the guy did work with his father, his son. Mm. St- I think a lot of people should be doing that this day and age. That if you don't have a good relationship, especially with your father as a boy, mm. in my opinion, you need to have a good relationship with your dad. I really admire your relationship with your dad. I'm still convinced somewhere along the line when you called him a motherfucker on the podcast <laughs> that he that he backhanded you across the table and you, you probably <laughs> edited it. You probably edited it out. <laughs> oh, but yeah. no, and like like if there's ever any envy inside me, I I truly <laughs> envy the fact that you've got a really good relationship with your father. I mean, I have a good relationship with my father, but I can't I can't talk to him like a like a, a friend. friend. Yeah, you see. and I can't be completely open because. My dad is also very old school, yeah. and he, if I do start opening up and talking about things, he'll look at me and think I'm weird. Yeah, no, my you dad know? thinks I'm fucking. And weird. I mean, those are the <laughs> those are the cards that I've been dealt, you know. Yeah. Um, so we spoke earlier about uh, breaking generational curses. What what I do with my daughters, mm. I have the most open conversations with my daughters. They are 11 years old. Okay, I talk politics. I talk. Uh, general world happenings, things that are going on in the world, blah, blah, blah. And they are a lot smarter for it mm. than than the other kids in their grade. And they always know that I'm always open. And if I feel like expressing myself in a way to them uh, to get a point across, they know that I'm going to do that. I don't molly coddle. I don't, yes, my love, no, my love. Uh, I'll wait till you're 16 to have a real conversation with you. I talk to them now, mm. you know. And they actually have quite a quite a good worldly view because of how open I am in communication with them, mm. which I think is important. It must be, yeah. Don't shelter, shelter, shelter. Slowly but surely, as the child gets older, show them what the real world is about and talk to them about the real world. Yeah, you know? I, I'm not gonna. Lie. I can't comment much on that because I'm not there. But you can. You can. What do you? What do you? What do you think about? That? No, I, I I love what you're saying. You know, and it's very similar. I was born a generation late, so my dad's in his 80s. Right. Sure. I'm in my 30s. Uh, so he is from that generation as well. Mm-hmm. Like, what I suppose, you know, I, it's hard to comment when it's you, right? Because mm-hmm. how do you take yourself out? You, you yeah. I've, been, I've had these thoughts before. And what I found is working to an extent um, is I just go and spend time. And even if uh, early days we used to just sit quietly and have a cigarette together and it would mm-hmm. be cool. Mm-hmm. You know, and to me that was quite all right. Um, and as I went into the working world and, and it's quite similar I mean what do I do I do a lot right? yeah. so from stuntman into the financial services industry mm. and, and you got this generation where we were brought up to go doctor, lawyer, accountant and the fact that I didn't become any one of those I went to go work on films you know there's a whole backstory behind that but it's kind of what I realized and I gave some thought is to that generation, they just want to know that you can keep the roof over your head. Mm. And, and I thought about it, right? That generation wasn't creating the luxuries. That, there was, I don't think I heard the word Lamborghini growing up. Mm. Yeah, like, look sure. at what we have. We've got a lot more if you look at it. For sure. And if you look two generations ago, um, it was a lot it's, it's a stereotype. Like, your grandparents came off a boat, you know? So, sure. And I gave some thought to this. I'm like, maybe the grandparents came off and what they needed to do was just put a roof over the head. And that's what our parents grew up in. So to understand where Mm. they come from. Mm. And then they kind of had their whole life to create a level of comfort, perhaps, right? Mm. And this may may be different demographically, whether you're black, Indian, etc., right? White and so on. Um, And then we've got our generation that has the whole world in front of us, technology, progression beyond measure. And at the same time, we're dealing with issues, whether that's mental health or whatnot. Um, what is our purpose? Is it because yeah. we've got the comfort, we've had the security, yeah. two generations, what uh, is the purpose of our generation? Coming back to relationship with dad, I just 
now when I spend time, I share and, and leave it open for him to share. Mm. And it's been working, you know. So as a, as a father, I mean, I spend a lot of time with my boys. I was, I was telling Andrew earlier, so I, I kind of retired three years ago. Mm. And I took a knock, you know. I could have been on the bandwagon, corporate life, printing money. But is it all about money, and which is a whole nother thread, mm. to do what I felt like I wanted to do, which is watch my kids grow up. And try, I try my best. You know, I have conversations. I, I try to show as much love and support and encouragement uh, for anything they're interested in. A mm. uh, good reminder that I keep to myself uh, quite regularly is they are not me. And if we don't mm. fact check that, I mean, we want what's best for them. Mm. We're going to give advice based on our experiences, our mistakes. Yeah, for sure. Like, assuming that they're going to do the same thing. What if they don't want to be part of the world as we know it, which is technically a capitalist world. Mm. If you look at the world, mm. we don't talk about on the internet or anything about billions of people that don't have access to internet or that sort of lifestyle, yeah. which we see as the world yeah, we have and what we compare against. Kind of yeah, what if they want to go and be humanitarian if you were yeah. to divide the two worlds? Mm. I mean, I'd like to say now I'm okay with that. What I choose to think and believe about that, which is make a lot of money, uh, so and that they hope. can do that. These are my thoughts. Yeah. They may not want to any of it. Yeah. So yeah. I suppose if we water it down into what I'm trying to accomplish with kids is I just hope I can teach them to be able to make their own decisions quite nicely mm -hmm. <laughs> if I can get that and right. To look for information <laughs> to make those decisions. <laughs> yeah. We all want the best for our children and, and, and to a certain extent that programming from our parents from those generations means that you know, we, we were we were pushed, doctors, lawyers, veterinarians, whatever it was. I mean, I was in my trick and I had to decide what I was going to do because my, my, my parents were pushing me to go to uh, college or go to university. And I chose architecture. I was good at drawing. I was mm. good at technical drawing. So I did, I did a four-year course and got my degree over five years because um, I was lazy. I had to go back and do another subject. <laughs> but eventually... So I did architecture. I went into the corporate world. I did architecture for seven years. And after seven years, I was like, what am I doing? Mm. And then when I went home and I told my father that I'd resigned, he said, what are you going to do now? I said, well, don't worry, because I've already phoned my mate who's got a personal training studio. And I'm going to go become a personal trainer. I was about 25 years old, 26 years old. And my dad looked at me and he said, <laughs> you're going to do what? And I said, I'm going to go do personal training. I'm going to teach people how to train in the gym. And he was, he was broken, you know, like the fact that I'd sort of taken this architectural career and just sort of sidelined it. Mm. And after probably... Which I can understand a little bit. After like, six months, yeah. I was making more in personal training than I was being, a, being a, an architectural designer in a corporate architectural environment. But that's crazy, though, because I know a lot of people that do physical, like PT now, and it's not... It's not as... I don't... Because I think it's more watered down. Well, how badly saturated. do you want it, right? I mean, no. this is the individual speaking. Crazy. And to that point, as Crazy. a father now, I mean, mm. I'm so, it's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah? So if someone says to me, and I'm not trying to be the John Lennon in the room here, okay? Yeah. But if someone says to me, what do you want your daughter to be when she grows up? Mm. I'll tell her I want my daughter to be happy. Mm. And when they go, what do you mean? I'm going to say, if my daughter wants to become a florist and open a shop and sell flowers and that makes her happy, that's all I care about. Do it. Yeah. I will not push her to become, she's very smart, mm. and she's perfectly uh, capable of possibly following what she thinks she's going to do now, which is become a surgeon. Mm. I mean, she's 11 years old. What does she know? <laughs> what? Okay. She knows a lot. She hon <laughs> no, man, she, she honestly... <laughs> look, it changes every week. I mean, her religion changes every week as well. So, like, sure, like the kids are in that ex experimental mm. phase of their lives. Where one minute they want to be a doctor, the next minute they want to and become a meteorologist or an astronomer or whatever it is. I mean, mm. I've been through all of them with her, you know. Mm. And when she eventually settles on what it is that she wants to do, then I'll be happy with that. Mm. As long as she's happy. Because getting up every day and doing the same thing and working, you've got to be passionate about what you're doing. But Otherwise, here's a thought, you're, Andrew. You're Isn't that time. the whole point? Like, I'm amazed at the fact that you're telling me she's trying and wants to be all of these things. It's the equivalent of us in business 
trying something, failing, trying something, failing. That those are the That's moments. Exactly. It, That's it doesn't stop. As you said, the, when the experimental stuff, yeah. it doesn't stop. Yeah. <laughs> we 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 no, know. No, it doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't stop. Doesn't. So that that's beautiful. Man. It is I love beautiful. To hear. I mean, I've always been like that. I mean, I've done a million things since I left school. You know, I've done architecture, I've done bodyguarding, I've done so you personal did training, publishing I've, done, too, I've done publishing, <laughs> I've done everything. And there's more that I want to do because I don't want to reach the age of seventy-five years old one day, sitting in a chair, you know, with my diaper on, and saying to myself, maybe I should have tried that mm. because I always had an interest in it. Would you allow her to be on a podcast? Who? Your daughter. I think Do you know how cool think that conversation would be, bro? <laughs> oh, man. It was only a couple of years ago. Okay, She had four <laughs> occupations. She, it was, okay, so bear with me now. It was surgeon, rock star, um, geologist, and there was another one which I can't remember. I said, babe, where are you going to find the time to do all these things? She mm. said, well, during the day I'm going to be a surgeon. Yes, man. At <laughs> night I'll be on stage, star. I'll be a rock star. Yeah. And then on weekends maybe I'll do some geology and I'm like, baby, it doesn't work that way. But, you know. But it can. <laughs> Who, am <I> <laughs> it really can. Who am I to say? It really can. Who am I to say? Maybe um, you drop ship rocks. When are you going <laughs> to sleep? I said to her, when are you going to sleep? <laughs> she said, no, I'll, I'll sleep when I'm tired. Don't worry about it. <laughs> like, so nonchalant. <laughs> just kind of completely. But is that not like such it. a, I think a lot of people lose that growing up. You know, they get told this, you can do one thing and one thing only. And, mm. you know, that's that. You don't, you don't have a choice in the, mm. in the, in the matter. But I think, as you say, like being an entrepreneur, yourself also retiring at what? How old are you now? 35 in this month. So 32. 34. No, but you're 35 this month. 34 this month. 34 this yeah. month. Okay, well, anyway. I mean, and what the hell is retirement? You yeah, know, it's a you, cool thing yeah. to say. And yeah. 100%, there's a nice stroke on the ego when yeah. you say it. I shit you not. Because the truth is, what the hell is it? Mm. It isn't. I but would, this yeah. is why I love entrepreneurship or doing whatever because you, you can do whatever you want. Truly, as long as there's money coming in, you can do whatever. It's really time. Yeah, that's the answer. And and you know, I I kind of feel sorry. I mean, I hope and I wish everybody well. But this whole retired sixty five thing, uh, you're gonna wait till all that time before you start having, having the thoughts life. that mm. I, I think about this. It's like a personal thought that I write about. You know, I wouldn't say having a life. It's just. Doing when I made that do. decision, there was a lot of change. There was a lot of thoughts. There was a lot of emotion and relative to time. So yeah. it was only in year two, so 2021, when I found myself for a solid week being very confused about who the hell I am. Mm. Or because I missed the recognition of mm. that, I mean, the awards and stuff, right? Mm. People, you are someone in a circle. Mm. No, I'm, mm. just, I'm just me just, yeah. in my own because space. Start, yeah. And I had to deal with that. Mm. Now... I, I write and I go, because this is the career I came from, and I still work with a lot of people, and I, I do give a shit. And I'm like, you, you can't tell people what to do, but it's, it crosses my mind. I wonder what it's, it, it would be like for somebody in the past or possibly the future that would have to or, or wait for this moment in time where they go, oh, I'm going to take pension. And then they got to face thoughts that, I mean, as human beings, we could experience things at any moment in time, right? And you should experience oh, as much well, as possible. Well, should is relative, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of a sad thought when I think about it. I'm like, if more people could just give themselves more time or at least realize that the game is actually time. And we don't even know if we have plenty of it. Mm -hmm. Like, assuming we have all the money in the world today. Mm. Well, there's no guarantee we're living, waking up tomorrow. No. Yeah, you are. So... I don't know, man. It's just and, a nice but space. But as you say, time, time is the thing. I mean, what was that one reel that just went viral where the guy was like, if I had to give you $10 million today, mm. but you don't get to wake up tomorrow, that wasn't what are you a reel. I told you that on our last podcast. No, but didn't I saw a guy put it on a reel. <laughs> I, I, actually, you did tell me. I forgot. But anyway, so it, it just showed you. The guy's like, now take waking up tomorrow. And that, yeah. As you were saying, yeah. that you being here, having the time available to you is the most important thing. Currency yeah, yeah. In, I, in the world. I remember that he left the he left the little kicker of but you can't wake up tomorrow. He left that to right at the end because he yeah. said to them, "If I give you ten million dollars, how do you how would you feel?" And they were like, "Wow, gee, wow, that's amazing," you know. Yeah. And then he said, "But uh, yeah, um, if I gave you ten million dollars, but you couldn't wake up tomorrow, how would you feel?" And they were like, "Oh." Then all of a sudden, obviously, they started clicking. You know what he was trying to get at, the fact that life is more important. Mm. The why, why are we not waking up every day like that, sort of like with that zest for life? You're right. You're right. I mean, I think even in Andrew Tate's recent 
pod with um it wasn't with patrick it was the one afterwards he said humans are a funny funny thing because when he was sitting in jail he said you know i can't wait to get out of jail when i'm out of jail i'm going to be doing this and this you know i, I can't wait he gets it like after a while you don't think about what you were thinking about when you were in jail mm. i can't wait to wake up tomorrow to mm. go do more things but mm. when you're there to, for that example i can't wait to wake up tomorrow because then i'm out of jail so you wake up it's the same as a holiday yeah like if, from personal experience i know i struggle to wake up in the morning me i've never been a great morning person like i'm happy when i wake up but i would take a while to get up when i got a holiday i got to be at the airport at five Four o'clock midwinter, I don't give a shit. I'm up, I'm ready, I'm mm. moving, I'm happy, you know, I'm excited. I'm You're excited, going to go yeah. do my thing. But why can't I do that every day? Like, mm. yeah, I, I get that. It's such a, oh, that's a mind boggle, actually. So why do you think that is, Andrew? Why? Well, why, why do we get complacent about that zest for life, which is so important? I think complacency is normal. Um, I don't think that we... I think it's very difficult to train yourself to wake up every day with that like go 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 i mean everyone needs sort of a bit of downtime you know mm. and like if you're a happy person all the time i don't believe you can be happy all the time i don't believe you can be sad all the time so yeah. things within our 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 mentality go through sort of stages where maybe we're busy with a project and therefore there's motivation to get up every day and really push 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 but on the times that we're not really sort of driven you know, then you have mornings where you don't want to get out of bed or you have mornings where you don't feel like working or whatever it is. I think everything's in a cycle. Mm. And I think it's very difficult to, you know, read the motivational book and just be that guy every day that gets up and goes, another day, another day, another day, every single day, like Groundhog Day, you know. Um, so I think things do go in cycles. I mean, like mo being motivated to go overseas. I mean, I'd be awake at three. I probably wouldn't sleep that night. <laughs> I, I'd be so excited, you know, so... You've got the you've got the power of motivation, but then also you've got the power of discipline. You know, when you're not motivated, you've got to be disciplined. You got to do it, even though you don't want to. Yes, because if we only did the things that we want to do on when a daily basis, we'd never get anything done. It's true. It's true. Like you don't want to go to work today. Yeah, I just won't go to work today. Yeah. Tomorrow your business isn't there. Mm. Basically, mm. that's actually sure. I'm trying to think about that now. Yeah, it's just, it's great to think about it. I love thinking about those things, bro. But that's what, what does that prophet that thought too much and die? Wasn't Socrates? Socrates is a stoic. Yeah, he's a stoic. Philosopher. Right? Mm. Philosopher, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's one of the... You say he got like he a brain and you... This is a stoic principle. Because <laughs> he thought um, too much. No, no. <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> thinking about thinking. Uh, one method, right? And I'd love to hear more methods, right? Uh, from a stoic principle, because you mentioned the group and, and you, you subscribe to stoicism. Um, let's start it off. Memento Mori. Remi uh, rem uh, always keep in mind that you can die at any point in time. 100%. And if you keep those thoughts present, mm. all of a sudden you can reignite. Look, I've, I've, I've had, not that I'll get into it here, I mean, it's a long story, but I've had some NDEs in my time. Uh, I had a really bad car accident in, in 2007 where I almost died two, three times. And still suffering the repercussions of it, you know, like 17 years later, but... That made me very impulsive, mm. um, so much so that patience went out the window. I mean, when I was in business and I wanted to get something done, I've always known from, from my experience of almost dying, I've known that you know, tomorrow is never guaranteed. And not that I'd wish everyone to go through what I've been through from a physical ailment point of view, but if you can develop the mindset that you might not be here tomorrow, get it done today, that's a very strong uh mm. principle to carry around with you very very strong i think people don't think like it, it's the same as anything it's like being told don't do that it will burn you until you go and mm. burn yourself you're not going to know that it's not going to burn you yeah so i get that you're yeah, near death experience i haven't had one personally but um i feel like i've been lucky enough to kind of train my mind in that sort of way not a hundred percent but it's you know life is i wouldn't say life is short but you can do as much things mm. as possible but as you say you might might not be here tomorrow i know friends that i grew up with died at 21 mm. died at 18 they didn't live their life died at 30 i mean someone now sure recently i can't even remember they were like 30 mm. 36 37 and gone there's their life 
finished. You only need to listen to someone who's had been through the experience or has life experience that sits you down, looks you in the eye and says, trust me that you know tomorrow is a gift, but it's not guaranteed. And if that doesn't start ringing bells and you start living your life according to that, then you're not really listening to what people are saying. Yeah. I think it's really important to pick up on things that people can teach you. Everyone has something that they can teach you. For sure. And um, I think it's really important to listen and you know take what you need and Learn. and yeah. reject what you don't. At the end what, of the day. What, what was your saying in our pod, the first one we did? What did it go like? If you're not open to learning... <laughs> You're just a dick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was one of my favorite cuts of all time. But, I, have, um, I haven't seen that in any stoicism books, I must be honest. No, no. <laughs> Nabil's going to write one. <laughs> Thoughts of Nabs. <laughs> Modern but, day interpretations exactly. of stoicism. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not open to learning, you're a dick. <laughs> you can have Morgan Freeman narrate it. You yeah. make it an audio book. <laughs> Uh, so, Andrew, we're going to end off with one more thing here. What, what would you tell the people watching this podcast? What, what kind of advice would you give them right now? As from, let's say from a, an 18-year-old boy growing even to now like a 50-year-old man, 60-year-old man that's going through it. I think that um, when you're growing up, following the crowd is not always the right way to go about things. I've always been the one that walks left when everyone walks right and taken the criticism with it. Um, life is something that I think that has to be experienced and it has to be lived. And don't don't uh, spend too much time trying to create a life instead of living a life. You know, I, I'm a big believer in living your life. And, you know, take chances. I've taken chances my whole life. Some of them have paid off, some of them haven't. But um, also having a free mind and being open to different, different principles of life. Travel as much as possible. Nothing will ever broaden your horizons and your perspective of, of human beings and life like, like travel does. For sure. And I think that the sooner you can get out of your sort of country or your, your community and really get to experience different cultures, um, I think the sooner you are to learning, learning that there's more to the world than just your 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 little community and mm. your your daily routine. Mm. That's beautiful. Nabs, you got anything left for the rest of the day? Man, I just like I can listen to this man the whole day. Bro. I know. And he's got a great <laughs> voice too. And I'm just like sitting like, oh, okay, that's nice. <laughs> oh, but um I think yeah, we 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 put quite a bit, even the parts that we missed out on in the beginning. But this was a this was a lovely conversation. I'm so glad we we had this. Like Thank you. first one back, this was great to be in the space again i actually forgot how much i missed doing this doing this kind of thing and your message is inspiring man next time just bring the cigars okay 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 men's, <laughs> men's conference men's conference we're gonna do it men's conference we're gonna do it sunglasses cigars and whiskey <laughs> sunglasses cigars and whiskey andrew okay. can you tell us where we can find you online yes um my instagram handle is at maverick but it's spelt m-a-v-3-r-i-k um, for all the gentlemen that want to join us on the Facebook group, the group is called The Relentless Man. Mm. It's a private group, so I'm not sure if it comes up that easily when you search for so. it. If you guys want on, then just DM one of the three of us and we can. Okay. But, and um, yeah, obviously there's my personal account, Andrew Carruthers, online. If anyone wants to you know, see what I'm up to on a personal level, they're welcome to join my Facebook account. Awesome, man. Cool. And uh, I wish you well. I'm really excited to check out the group myself. Thank yeah. you. And if we can yeah, get, I'd love channel. to see what we can contribute to the community. That would be agree. fantastic. Thank I you. I agree. You can count the modern man in to the relentless man. That's perfect. Thank you. But, uh, outro. Outro. What? Was that it? Or must I give an outro? No, but outro. You have to oh, give an outro. Oh, must I? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was so confused. You're getting a bit right? rusty, man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If anything, I hope this episode has given you um, some insight to what it is to be a positively masculine man, um, some pointers that you should be doing in your life. And uh, yeah, if you're ever thinking about killing yourself or suicide, just know that we'd rather listen to your story than read your eulogy. And uh, yeah, from the modern man, please like, subscribe, leave your comments about what you guys think, and uh, we will see you guys on the next episode.